coming. Those of you who came from the uh, Prophecy Conference, you have my sound yet? Okay. Um, uh, welcome. Uh, Doug Krieger, who's going to help me in the second hour, uh, was late uh, getting here this morning. He said that, now Doug wrote a book called Signs on the Heaven and on the Earth, but he missed the sign for the church. <laughs> I don't know if there's some kind of prophetic thing there. And this is great because I get to talk and he can't. So, yet. <laughs> so, I love Doug Krieger and uh, I think you'll enjoy some of the things he has to say second hour. The, um, we're all tired. Uh, I, do, I really do appreciate everybody that helped at the conference. We had a lot of... Uh, people online, there were people overseas that were uh, listening. Um, and so it's just, I so appreciate this church and the, the willingness of this church to, to invest the time and money in the live stream equipment. And uh, then the guys in the Prophecy Forum, it's been a, a real blessing to work with them over the last few months. And we've spent a lot of time on the phone uh, planning this thing. And, and uh, I think everything went went pretty well. You know, there were some glitches here and there. I, I told Coach Dave's assistant that came with him, I said, now you need to tell Dave Daubemeyer that those five-hour energy things, <laughs> it's one every five hours, <laughs> not five every hour. So, okay, today we're going to look at the churches of Philadelphia. Now, as you know, they've been around here. It takes us a while to get through series. Me, a while to get through series. And I'm not sure why. I think it's probably because I'm afraid that if I finish anything, the Lord will call me home. And uh, <laughs> although I'm not really worried about that, but it's just that, you know, I got stuff to say. And uh, <laughs> so we've been in the book of Revelation, the first part. Uh, now, it's interesting. I was doing some looking back through my archives. And I found that when we were, a lot of us were at another church and I was teaching Adult Bible Fellowship, I actually did a series on the seven churches and the PowerPoints, it was 1999. And so when I restarted, I just want you to know that nobody said, hey, you've done this before. I re you know, you don't remember, do you? And that's okay, because I didn't remember. I had to go back and look. And I, you know, the interesting thing when I looked at was, you know, people used to say, those were nice PowerPoint slides. If I put them up now, you would, you know, you would take my computer away from me. So Revelation divided into three parts. Chapter 1, the things you have seen, John, on the Isle of Patmos. Uh, chapters 2 and 3, the letters of Jesus to the seven churches, the things that are. And then chapters 4 through 22, the things that shall be hereafter. Um, the seven letters just by way of review they have different applications you will find application from what is taught in the seven letters in every church people will need to hear the message of all seven letters uh, each person will have need to hear the message of all seven letters but there were also these were seven literal historic churches in Asia Minor and Turkey and then there is a prophetic aspect some people think that the uh, prophetic aspect is that the church is divided into the church era, the history of the church is divided into seven eras. And those eras uh, correspond in order of the seven churches. And there is some uh, truth to that. So those churches, we start of course with the, uh, the first church, which is the church uh, at Ephesus. And each church got a report card. Each letter starts off with the title of Christ, and then for five of the churches, there's um, a commendation. Two churches, Sardis and Laodicea, have no commendation. There's a condemnation for five of the churches. Two, Philadelphia, is, has no condemnation from the Lord. And then there's an exhortation to each church and then a promise to the overcomer. So the first church is the church at Ephesus, a major city in Asia Minor at the time. It was a church where... Uh, there was this uh, a, a town where there was this great massive temple to Artemis, Diana, and it was they kept they kept getting destroyed by earthquake. It was actually burned by 
a guy who wanted to make a name for himself in 356 BC. Interestingly enough, the night that he burned the temple in Ephesus, Alexander the Great was born in Macedonia. And the legend became that Diana was too busy trying to protect her temple and that uh, she was uh, busy attending at the birth of Alexander the Great and therefore could not attend to someone trying to attack her temple. Uh, it was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world and we know that it was, there was a temple there at the time of Paul and when uh, Paul came in there to teach and they got upset and they stood a man up in front of the crowd who they said, wait a minute, he's a Jew and they shouted for two hours, you know, great is Diana, you know, our goddess. And um, you can read about that in the Acts chapter 19. So the church at Ephesus um, was a church that left its first love. It was a church where probably historically John, the Apostle John was the pastor, but it eventually left its first love. Then we go on to the church at Smyrna, the persecuted church a church that had no condemnation from the Lord. And then from uh, Smyrna, we go on to the church at Pergamum. And we spent a lot of time talking about the church at Pergamum just because uh, there's this very interesting uh, configuration. It was a, a, on the Acropolis there above Pergamum. There was this uh, temple, uh, uh, temple complex. You had the temple to Zeus over here. You had temples to uh, Trajan and some of the Roman emperors. You had this amphitheater in the middle that sat about 10,000 people, to give you some idea of the scope of this. But we looked at this temple here on the, uh, this part of the Acropolis, the Temple to Zeus, because historically that temple was very significant. Eventually, uh, what was left of the temple was taken to the Pergamum Museum in Berlin, uh, reconstructed to look like this and a young man named uh, Albert Speer, who later became the architect for the Nazi empire, was very impressed by that building. And if you look at the rally grounds, uh, the Nazi rally grounds at Nuremberg, you'll see this exact same configuration the, where uh, to mimic Zeus, that's where Hitler would stand at his podium and uh, make his pronouncements. And the Church of Pergamos, of course, uh, you could read about that in Revelation chapter 2. It's a church where Satan dwells. Then we go on to the church at Thyatira with that woman Jezebel and the church of continual sacrifice. And that church really corresponds in some respects to the era of the, the, high, the large uh, Catholic influence in the church and the continual sacrifice that happens where they, in this church, they, they think it's necessary to sacrifice Christ over and over again on an altar, every, on altars every day all around the world. And it was a church that um, had a severe condemnation. Then from Thyatira, we go on to the church at Sardis. And the church at Sardis uh, is an interesting study. It, uh, it had no commendation. There was nothing to recommend it. The people there were spiritually dead. Um, we said that we came up with this. They were Chinos, Christians in name only. And uh, it kind of reminds me of uh, there's a warning. If you don't wake up, I'm going to come as a thief in the night with the implication that if you are awake, he will not come as a thief in the night. And the message to the church was you're dead, so wake up is what you're supposed to do. And I love this. You know, I was thinking this, in fact, I'm thinking of making this my life verse now. I was reading this this morning in 1 John, um, sort of the first part of the chapter and the end of the chapter. I love both, but I love this verse. You know, look at this verse. My little children, I'm writing to you these things so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate. We have a lawyer with the Father. <laughs> Jesus, so all you people who make those lawyer jokes, take a look at this verse. There's no artist making, standing in front of the Father, no mathematician, no marketing person, no, no accountant. You, for goodness gracious, you don't want an accountant keeping track of everything. You want to, when it's crunch time, you want a lawyer pleading your case. 
and you want the best lawyer. <laughs> so um, that's what you want. But the verse, the chapter concludes with this great admonition, though. Now, little children, abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink at his, in, away from him in shame at his coming. So I always think of that verse as, you know, it's not, you don't want to be in the position, was that the trumpet? You know, God, could just give me a few minutes. I got some things to clean up and then, you know, blow it again. You want to say, hey, it's a trumpet, I'm ready. That's the way you're supposed to live. And then the church at Sardis, or Philadelphia, which we'll talk about today, the church of brotherly love. And then finally, the church we'll talk about in the second hour, uh, the church at Laodicea, the church of people's opinions or people judged, depending on how you want to interpret that name. So the seven letters to seven churches, and again, today we're going to be in Philadelphia. A city in Asia Minor, it uh, sat in a valley uh, between Sardis and Laodicea. It was not a particularly wealthy city. Uh, I'm not going to go into the history of it. But Jesus really spoke well of the believers that lived here. Uh, they had little power, but they remained faithful. They were noted for their love for one another. What's curious about Philadelphia is that the description that you see of the church is of all the churches in the Revelation, it's probably the most uh, Hebraic or Jewish, and there's even a Davidic motif, I'll talk about that just briefly in a moment. And it had a largely unbelieving Jewish community with the synagogue, and the uh, persevering uh, saints at, at uh, Philadelphia were, were praised by the Lord. There was no condemnation given to the Lord. Let's just read the passage again in Revelation chapter 3 and get into this. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, He who is holy, who is true, and has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one opens, says this, I know your deeds. Behold, I have put before you an open door which no one can shut, because you have a little power, and have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie, I will make them come and bow down at your feet and make them know that I have loved you. Because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I will also keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have so that no one will take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will not go out from it any more. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So the first thing is all the letters in the church, the, to the seven churches start off with, it starts off with the name of Christ. And usually that name is, contains within it an admonition to the church, or it's, it addresses something that the church may need to emphasize or correct. So here at Philadelphia, it is he who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David, and no one will shut, and who shuts it, no one open. So the key of David uh, is, uh, represents the messianic authority of Jesus. He comes from the line of David. There's a detailed genealogies in Matthew and Luke to establish who he is, the, the lineage that he had, that this was a man, when he was born, he was the one who was rightful heir to sit upon the throne of David, his father. And this was a messianic prophecy. And he's not sat on that throne yet, at least here in, in Jerusalem. And we know that that day is coming, that day may be coming very soon. We talk about it all the time. And then the commendation to the church at Philadelphia, I know your deeds. And they were good. I've put before you an open door which no one can shut because you have a little power and have kept my word and have not denied my name. And here we see that the church, it wasn't a powerful church. It wasn't a mega church. It didn't have a huge amount of influence but what the Lord looked at was what the hearts of the people were and what they wanted to, what they did, 
what was important to them, and the Lord found that they were faithful, they loved each other, and they did what he wanted them to do. A good admonition for us. They didn't have indoor playgrounds. They didn't have fancy sound systems, but they were a faithful, true church that did what they were supposed to do. You have kept my word. This is what's important. You have kept my word and have not denied my name. There are so many churches today that only mention Jesus at passing. And we try to emphasize Jesus every week here because it's only through Jesus, only through Jesus, that we have any hope at all of our salvation. We really want him to be our advocate. You don't want some fancy lawyer in an office building downtown. You really want somebody good. You want Jesus, the perfect advocate. And the church had no condemnation. No condemnation at all. I'm going to trip on that if I don't pick it up. And then finally, the uh, exhortation to the church in Philadelphia. Now, it talks about the synagogue of Satan. We talked about that in earlier passages in uh, the letter to the seven churches, so I'm not going to go into that. But it, the identity of this is those who say they are Jews and are not but lie. Now, my concern is that this verse, um, you need, a, when you hold a position relative to eschatology, we know that the, the, the founding principle of Israel and the Jews is that I'll bless those who bless you, bless you and curse those who curse you. That's what it says in Genesis chapter 12. And my concern today is that there are many prophecy eschatological views that people hold and while they will defend to the death that they're not anti-Semitic. You need to look at the view and see whether it really is. And there is a view out there about the synagogue of Satan that the Jews are, they're fake Jews in Israel today. They're not really Jews, and so this is, they, make, they take this verse and apply it to what's going over there in Israel. I believe that is a gross error. I find it offensive. I find it eschatologically wrong, untrue. Because we know, we talk about it all the time, Ezekiel 35 and 36, God called those people back. He's brought them back initially in unbelief, but for a time of sort of peaceful prodding about coming to the Messiah. Now, we know that there's things coming that will be very difficult for them. We know from, Zachar uh, from different passages that they're going to be two-thirds of them killed during the 70th week of Daniel. It's not going to be pretty. But God ultimately will use that time to bring out the remnant of what he wants, that, and all Israel will be saved. And remember, you know, people say, well, they're not... They're not uh, they're not faithful yet. You know, there's a lot of atheists. They, they do abortions. They have same-sex marriage. They do all, and that's right. They do. They, they do all that stuff wrong. So do we in this country. But God brought them back. It was miraculous. After thousands, a couple thousand years, they're brought back to the land from all the nations. And we know that they're going to be there in unbelief. Ezekiel 36 says that. I'm going to bring you back to the land not, cause, not because you deserve it. You people went out there, you, you committed harlotry, you were spiritual whores in the, in the nations where you were sent. You weren't faithful to me, but I said that I would restore you and my holy name is at stake and so I'm gonna bring you back. And it's just, and as I've said before, that speaks to the glory of God in his truthful word. It's the same way with you. The fact that you're saved, that I'm saved, that any of us ever get saved is to God's glory, not ours. And he should get all of the glory. 
So I, I find this view very, very troubling where people talk about the synagogue of Satan. But it says that these, these, these fake Jews, at least the, that's being referenced in this verse, these are people that you know, gave the appearance of Judaism, but when the people came to talk about the Messiah, they rejected everything. And it says, eventually they will come and bow down at your feet and make them know that I have loved you. And now verse 10. Now, I'm uh, treading on thin ice with some people here, I think. This verse says this. Because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I will also keep you from the hour of testing. That hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Now, um, this verse has, for whatever reason, it's a great verse. I believe it, okay? I believe it applies to me. I believe it applies to all believers. But as we talked at the conference this weekend, there are different views about the timing of the rapture. And good brothers hold different views, and people are very passionate about it, and there's a lot of arguing. And as I said at the conference the other night, I love everybody. <laughs> but it, this verse will be interpreted depending on what your view of the timing of the rapture is very often. And this verse, many consider to be the, the central linchpin of a pre-trib rapture. I'm not, and I'm not here to denigrate that. I want that to be true. But trust me, believe me, because I've read that rest part of the book, and I don't want to. I'd prefer to watch that thing from the balcony, so to speak. But it talks about I'm not. You know, as I've studied this over time, uh, I have become. I guess, uncomfortable with that interpretation of the verse. It, first of all, it talks about an hour of testing, not a week, not seven years, or anything like that. And it also talks about when you look at it in context, it says that hour which is about to come upon the whole world, and the purpose of which is what? To test those who dwell on the earth, and that means those who have their, almost like their fingers dug in. To the earth, the earth dwellers. Now, what I believe is that the testing has to do with, I think it's related to the apostasy. And so Jesus says in the end times, if we're here, let's just assume that we're here, there will be a great apostasy, great deception in Matthew chapter 24, and, and Paul, and 2 Timothy, and elsewhere. The the most stark warnings and the most consistent warning in the New Testament to believers is, do not be deceived. Don't let anyone deceive you. Jesus talked about it more than anybody else. And all the other warnings and signs, he talked about deception probably four times more than all that. So it's a really important thing. And the way I'm leaning towards viewing this verse now is that during that time of testing, when the deception will be so great that even Jesus says that those days weren't shortened, even the very elect would be deceived. That God will, for his faithful people, for people who live like the church in Philadelphia, he will protect them during that hour. He will pour out his Holy Spirit, I think, in a special way to protect people, to help them understand. And as I look around the landscape now, I see this, what I see happening with this conference and Facebook groups and other things is I see people of God who are part of the faithful remnant finding each other and coming together. And I think it is a Holy Spirit thing. I think it is miraculous in its way. Uh, I talked, one thing that I was encouraged about the conference this weekend, were the, did you notice the number of young people there? This is very unusual. 
usually, you know, you go to a conference and the, the question is, you know, who will have more, a higher percentage of walkers, the speakers or the, the crowd that comes? And um, didn't see any really this weekend. And, but there were a young couple there with a, a seven month old baby or a 10 month old little baby girl. And I thought, boy, this little girl, she's, she's got a leg up on everybody in her generation. And praise the Lord that her parents uh, brought her. And I heard her kind of screaming a couple times. I don't know if it was, I couldn't tell if it was joy or anger or frustration, but it was great to hear. I like to hear that because it, it shows that there's a couple of faithful parents that really want to make sure their kid's brought up in the right way. And they're not afraid to expose her to this stuff. I wish there were a lot of pastors that were there. I met a man last night, uh, Char uh, Charles, the pastor's a congregation down here in Columbus. Uh, I liked him because I stood next to him and my wife says, man, I didn't realize how slim you were. <laughs> and uh, I love those guys. Nephilim size, I mean, really, extra large Nephilim. And uh, he actually gave us, a, he sells cars, or works at a car place down south, and he had a card that said Big Chuck. Like, would never have picked that name out for him. But, uh, but he was talking about how um, he's African American in his community. Um, he can't get the people in his own church and other pastors in that community to preach the truth about prophecy, and he was just very distressed about it. So pray for Big Chuck and his church. He said he started preaching about it, and um, a lot of people left. And he said now he's down to just a, a handful. So now he's down to his remnant. He's down to the ones that God wants him to have. So, so when I say that test, that hour of testing, that hour, it's, it's not a week, it's an hour. It's an intense period of time, and I think that we're going to uh, look at that. Again, the people who dwell in the earth are those who um, have their fingers rooted in the earth. Now, the church at Philadelphia, if you look at it for, for its historical period, its historical period corresponds to that period of time when the churches, and it, it still it continued up into our era, when the churches were very active in sending out missionaries. And there are tons of stories. It, the church in England at that time, now England today, the church is dead, by and large. There are small, faithful remnant congregations around that gather regularly to, to study the Word of God deeply, but go back into the 1800s and you had people even in public life like Wilberforce who was uh, you know helped in slavery in the British Empire uh, and you had people like John Bunyan and there's a there's actually and these people eventually became hated by the the Anglican Church the mainline church of its day and so when they died it, it included John and Charles Wesley who um, started the Methodist, and pe people who were faithful evangelists, Dwight Moody, I would say, was sort of part of the evangelistic movement over there. Uh, John Bunyan, who wrote Pilgrim's Progress, probably one of the uh, best-selling books of all time, way beyond Purpose Driven Life. Don't believe the hype about it. It's a marketing hype, folks. I used to believe it, too. It's not true. There's many books that have sold way more than that book. But Buddy, these people are all buried. This is Bunyan's grave, uh, author of Pilgrim's Progress, died in 1688 at 60. Oof, it's not a good age. <laughs> <laughs> Today you would say he's such a young man. Back then he lived a good life, and he lived a faithful life. Wrote from prison, uh, suffered for the Lord, and was one of the great examples of the, the missionary spirit of the church in England at the time. And there are many stories. I was looking back through my archives. I could not find the presentation that I had prepared about um, a great grace brother missionary, James Gribble. Some of you know that story. 
Now he was uh, lived in the Phil I believe in the Philadelphia area, and he and his wife felt called to go to at the time French Equatorial Africa because they wanted to go into the darkest part, the into the center of Africa, to witness. And they had many problems getting going. They had to raise money. They got sick. They couldn't get over there. And they finally, after many years of trying, they arrived. And correct me if I'm wrong, Mike, but it was, I believe, within a year, James Gribble died. But the church in Central Africa grew. And at one point, about 20 years ago, people considered it to be the most heavily evangelized country on the planet. But there's a lesson to be learned there, too, because the church there has been undergoing severe persecution and testing. The Muslims have come in from the north, and those kind of tribal conflicts have risen. And you don't hear much about it on the news, but uh, you know, missionary organizations have completely pulled out of Central Africa. And it's not, from what I hear, it's not going in a good direction. And people are departing from the faith, and there's tribal conflict, and there's killings, and massacres, and there's at one point in time in the city of Bangui, which is a couple million people, I think there are about four million people in the country. Half of them live in the city, the capital city of Bangui, down along uh, the river there next to the Congo. And, you know, hundreds of thousands of people were, had, had to leave their home in the city because of the infighting and the Muslim uh, incursion and then the pushback from the Africans. It's been, it's been horrible. But that doesn't, it, it's a lesson similar to the lessons of the seven churches that if you remain faithful to the Lord and his word, you'll keep your candlestick. But if you don't, it's going to get removed. And when we look at Asia Minor today, where these churches once flourished, where the gospel really had its one of its first great periods of growth, there are no churches. Now we have an Islamic country. Uh, talk to a person who's an undercover, underground mission, uh, Muslim mission, missionary to the Muslims in Turkey. And he said, it's, it's really, really dark over here. The church, the light of the church has really gone out. And that has geopolitical consequences. But Jesus then says to the church, you know, there's the promise to the overcomer. I am coming quickly. Hold fast at what you have so that no one will take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of God. Now, there's a great book. Uh, if I loan this, cut my copy to someone, uh, bring it back. I, don't, I thought I did, but I, I can't find it. You will know what the book is when you pick it up, because if you drop it, it will break your foot. If you drop it on your, it will break all of the bones in your foot. It's that heavy. Uh, by Roger Liebel called The Messiah in the Temple. This book uh, is written from a strongly Jewish perspective. It is, I think it's 800 pages long. It has tremendous analysis of the imagery of the temple, mainly looking at the second temple. Uh, so it was through this book that I learned, for example, when Jesus is in the area of the temple, and it's the passage says, they uh, picked up stones to stone him. Where did they get those? Where the, at least I think the, the, the right answer I found in this book. The tradition was that when Antiochus Epiphanes came in and sacrificed a pig on the altar there in the temple, during the period of the Maccabees, the temple, was, the, the altar was desecrated. But because the stones had been consecrated to the Lord, the Jewish tradition is they took those stones and they put them over in a corner of the temple with the understanding that when the Messiah came, he would tell them what to do with those stones. But when the Messiah was there, when the light, the true light of the temple was actually there, they didn't pay attention to it. They actually picked up those stones to stone him. That's where they got the stones. 
At least that's what I've learned from that book and a, a lot of energy, uh, other imagery. So there's this, in, in verse 12 it says this, he who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of God and he will not go, and he will not go out from it anymore. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God in my new name. Who has an ear, let him hear what he says in his churches. And maybe Doug Krieger can talk about this a little bit second hour, but you know this new Jerusalem that comes down out of heaven and talking to him and some others, there's like, there's a veil right now that separates what we can see and what's going on in the heavenlies. But someday in our sight, that veil will be ripped apart, the new Jerusalem will descend, and the earthly Jerusalem and the new Jerusalem will be merged, I guess. There'll be a term, we'll watch this thing come down. Now, Doug, you think it's a pyramid shape, right? Both. Oh. Okay, well, maybe we'll have time for Q&A later, and he can do that. But one of the things there it says, and so we're looking forward to that, sort of that great time when Jesus comes back and sets up his kingdom and it builds you know, a new temple and dedicates it. And we'll be there for the, the, that feast of dedication that takes place. We don't have time to go into that this morning. But what it says in the verse there is that he will write on him the name of my God. Now, our friend Jacob Prash has a great teaching. Um, he's repeated it a number of times under different names, but if you want to hear a teaching that will um, spiritually blow your mind, uh, find when God writes. It is a tremendous teaching. And without going into it, he goes through the scriptures, as Jacob does, and he looks at Okay, the scripture here in John chapter 8, they bring to him the woman caught in adultery, and it says two times he stoops down and he writes in the earth. And so Jacob says, correctly, if you want to understand that, you need to look for other instances of when God writes in scripture. So we know that there's good writing. In Revelation chapter 3 here, we just read that if you're faithful, you'll become a pillar of God in the temple. You'll, and the pillar of God in the temple with inscriptions on it is not going to be one of those decorative things on the outside. It's going to be one of those important pillars in the middle that are holding it up. That's where we'll be. And we'll have a name written on us. And there's scripture uh, near the end. You know, they pull out the Bam Lamb's Book of Life. Every name that was written, are they written in that book? But there's also things that you don't want to have written about you, so to speak. And here in John chapter 8, and there's been a lot of controversy. What, what, and we know that after he did, it wrote down again on the ground that they all walked away. They dropped their stones and they walk away. Now he said, who's without the sin, without sin, cast the first stone? But what was it that he wrote? And this is what I appreciate about Jacob. I think I know now what he wrote. If you turn to Jeremiah chapter 17, we'll finish with this. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 13. Now understand the context of this in chapter 7, Jesus has just identified himself as, I am the living water. He who drinks from me will never thirst. And now here, they come bring him this woman caught in adultery, again to challenge his messianic claims. And so verse 13, I think, gives us a clue as to what they wrote, what he wrote. O Lord, the hope of Israel. This is from the ESV. I think the King James is similar. O oh Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be put to shame. 
those who turn away from you will be what? Written in the earth. For they have forsaken the fountain, the Lord, the fountain, they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living water. Now, do you have a clue as to what Jesus wrote in the earth? He was writing the names of all those men in judgment. And that's why they walked away slightly, because they knew that they, this was the Messiah, and their name was written into earth. They had been judged by God. Powerful verse. That's what we need. So you don't want your name written in the earth. You want it written on a pillar. You want it written in a book in heaven and on a pillar in the temple of God. That's where you want to be. So let's be faithful, show love, do the things, follow the example of the church in Philadelphia. An open door, willing to go out and share the gospel. I think that's what sort of drives the vid all this, you know, look, this live stream thing is amazing. We had, I don't know, 17 foreign countries watching the conference yesterday because you people saw the vision. So, uh, Doug Krieger, would you close our service in prayer, please? Are we going to do a song? I, don't, I didn't look at the order of service. <laughs> doxology? Okay. Let's stand and do the doxology, and then I'd like Doug Krieger to close our service in prayer. Mm -hmm.